Good morning. I'm Ray Roberts. I'm the pastor of River Road Presbyterian Church. And on behalf of a wonderful, loving congregation, I extend you greetings in Jesus Christ. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And to help us think about that, we're going to be reading from uh, John chapter 20, the story of the resurrection, as he presents it. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the tomb had been rem that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter and the other disciple set out and went to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood there, weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us pray. Gracious God, may the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. It is always sobering to stand beside a grave. Graves have a way of stripping away our illusions, our youthful longings for popularity and approval, our shallow materialism, the time that we waste, our unworthy goals. Everything frivolous is judged by the grave. Graves can remind us what matters, but they can also challenge us as to whether anything matters at all. And it is only as we face this challenge that we can understand the hope and the true meaning of the resurrection. In the musical Hamilton, Aaron Burr, I think, sings for all of us when he says, Death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes, and it takes, and it takes, and it takes. And because it takes, we fear death. In 1996, the philosopher Herbert Finnegaret wrote the book, Death, Philosophical Soundings. And in the book, he dismissed the fear of death. He said, fearing one's own demise is irrational. When you die, there's nothing. Why should we fear the absence of being when we won't be there ourselves to suffer it? 20 years later, in 2017, at the ripe old age of 97, he revised his point of view and in an interview filmed by his grandson, he said, It haunts me, the idea of dying soon, whether there's a good reason or not. I walk around and I ask myself, what's the point of it all? 
There must be something I'm missing. I wish I knew. What's the point of it all? That's what death takes from us. As it takes, and it takes, and it takes. What's the point of it all? When Mary stood beside Jesus' grave, she wept. She wept because death had taken so much. She wept because death had taken a friend. Jesus stayed with Lazarus and Martha, her brother and sister, and her at her home in Bethany during the last days when he was so stressed out. And now he's gone. Her friend is gone. Mary wept because Jesus was a good man. I mean, if he had been a criminal, perhaps you could say he had it coming. If he had been a nasty person, maybe she could have guiltily felt a sense of relief. But Jesus was a good man, and the cruelty and dehumanization of his crucifixion made it more wrong. It deepened the hurt. And Mary wept, of course, because of how Jesus died. He did not die of old age or some disease or even by a natural catastrophe, which would have been tragic. Jesus' death was intended, and it was unjust. People targeted Jesus because they were threatened by what he said. And they were threatened by what he did because Jesus ate with sinners and he confronted the money changers at the temple and he called out religious hypocrisy. Standing in front of the tomb, it looked like everything that Jesus had stood for, every cause that he advanced was defeated. You know, Jesus preached, the kingdom of heaven is near, repent, believe the good news. Well, there at the graveside, after the crucifixion, it looked like brutality ruled the world, not the kingdom of heaven. Mary wept because she lost a sense of God's benevolence and power. Do you remember how Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very heads, hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than the sparrows. Well, that's a beautiful thought, but after the agony and defeat of the crucifixion, how do you believe God's eyes on the sparrow? I mean, Mary heard Jesus from the cross. She was there when Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this cry seems like a repudiation of everything that Jesus stood for. Standing beside Jesus' grave shattered Mary's sense of the power of goodness over evil. And it probably shook her faith and confidence in God. So no wonder she wept. Not only were her illusions stripped away, but everything that she felt was precious and good and beautiful and true had been challenged and stripped away. And she doubtless wept out of a sense of futility and despair. Death does not discriminate. It takes, and it takes, and it takes. Christians gather together on Sunday morning because Mary learned something there as she stood by the grave. As her illusions were stripped away, she learned that Christ was risen. And in the resurrection, she found hope in the face of all that death had taken. The resurrection of Christ gives us hope that death does not and cannot triumph. As we stand next to the grave of a loved one, or if we face our own grave, the resurrection gives us confidence that death cannot hold us, that there is nothing in life or in death that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. And so we can face death unafraid. Earlier I mentioned the philosopher Finnegaret, who at the age of 97 ask, what's the point? Well, his grandson, who filmed the, his questioning, says that in 2018, a year after he said that, as Finnegret was dying, his last words were, were this, well, that's clear enough. Why don't we see if we can go up and check it out? And his grandson, reflecting on these words, said, I'd like to believe that he might have seen at least a glimpse of something beyond death. Well, the resurrection gives us firm reason to believe that death does not have the final word, 
We come from God and we return to God and we need not fear death. The resurrection of Jesus also gives us hope that the good and beautiful things that Jesus said and lived are true. The powerful people tried to silence Jesus and destroy everything that he was about. But in the resurrection, God said yes to all that he taught, that God's eye is on the sparrow, that if you lose your life for Christ's sake, you will truly find it, that forgiveness is not some fool's errand, that love conquers, and it is the way of peace. And as much as you care for the least of these, Jesus feels it. By raising Jesus from the grave, God said yes to everything that Jesus was about. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope that evil will not triumph, and so it saves us from despair. I remember many years ago driving my car and listening to National Public Radio to Terry Gross, uh, an interview that she was doing on her show Fresh Air. She was interviewing Ellie Wiesel. Ellie Wiesel is a Holocaust survivor and an author who's written a lot about the Holocaust. And Terry Gross asked Ellie Wiesel this question. She, sa she asked, tell me, how do you still believe in God after the Holocaust? I will never forget Ellie Wiesel's answer. He said, I'm often asked how I can still believe in God after the Holocaust, but it is odd to me that no one ever asks me how the Holocaust has tested my faith in humanity. The irony is that people who ask me how I still believe in God generally find it much easier to believe in humanity than in God. But after the Holocaust, I find it much easier to believe in God than in humanity. especially with all the challenges that we face at this moment in history, in our war-torn world where there is so much death, with the continued destruction of God's good creation, and with our polarized politics, we can be tempted to despair. We can look around at us, at what's around us, and just feel like it's all futile. Like, what's the point? The resurrection of Jesus tells us that there is a point. God is triumphant. Evil and sin and death will not have the last word. The resurrection gives us confidence that God is still at work in the world, redeeming and restoring God's beloved creation. And so as we stand by the grave and all our illusions are stripped away, we stand here in light of the resurrection and know that we have hope in God. Let us pray. Gracious God, uh, we thank you for the hope that you give us by raising Christ from the dead. Fill us with this hope so that we might be agents of your love and your reconciliation. Strengthen us so that we might live as those who do not fear death, but who have hope that you give to us, the promise of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, on behalf of the congregation, we wish you a really wonderful Easter. I do have a couple of announcements. One is uh, we are very grateful for your support of this ministry. Uh, without your support, we could not do it. And we're looking to expand things uh, going forward. I know I've been saying that to you for a while, but uh, we, we've got some new equipment that we've purchased, and some of it is installed, and we're learning how to use it. And once that happens, uh, you can expect some new things, and we'll be announcing that in the future. Uh, on March 23rd, excuse me, April 23rd, coming up this next Saturday, our church is in, going to be doing some work with a group called Rebuilding Richmond, and we're going to be rehabbing a house, and I hope that you will consider joining us. There should be some information on your screen about it. Now may the grace and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those you love and with those only God can love, wherever they may be, this day, henceforth, and forevermore.
Amen.